You all are at Inspiration Lake. I will be sitting in a metal tube flying overhead. In fact, I'll try to look down and see you because I think we fly over Inspiration. We fly over Inspiration Lake out there. Um, I'll be in the States for about three weeks with uh, uh, mom, maybe not quite three weeks, but right, right around there with mom and dad, take care of some things. I'll be speaking with um, people who support the ministry here and support the Sichuan outreach and the Philippines outreach as well. So I'll be having meetings with them and sharing these photos as well. So I'll be away for three weeks. I promise I'll be back, but you're in good hands and Pastor Renee will be here and um, some speakers will be here as well. Uh, pa uh, Pastor Anil will be with us as you see from your bulletin and he's going to bring wonderful, a wonderful encouragement as well. So <clears throat> we want to turn to the word of the Lord this morning and um, Pastor Renee, do, do you want to say anything about being late in the first service or just in the second service? Maybe the second one. Mainly the second one. Okay. Okay. We're going to talk about being late in the second service. We won't, we'll wait till we won't do it in this service. So we want to, I uh, want to conclude this morning with what we talked about uh, two weeks ago. Pastor Renee spoke last week and we want to look at our goals and God's purposes. So as we come to a conclusion this morning. Here we go. Okay, and uh, we're, we're going back to the main passages that we've looked at, but we come to a conclusion this morning. And if you'll remember, we talked about what God said to his people, what he said to Moses for his people. God told Moses, I've heard, I, I've seen what my people are going through, and I've heard their cries. Next slide. And so we know that what that reminds us is, one of the things it reminds us is, that God hears us and God sees us. We sometimes, when we go through difficulties, especially when it's been going on for a long time, we sometimes feel, God, you've forgotten me. Have you ever felt that? God, you've forgotten me. God, why haven't you answered? All of us struggle with that and all of us feel that. And here we have, in God's dealings with the children of Israel in the Old Testament, um, the way that God deals with them as he does with Job and we see something for us as well and God says I have heard them and I've seen them and I'm going to do something about it so I want to encourage you this morning if you've been going through a difficult time if you've been calling out to God for a long time and you're still waiting for an answer and, and an answer has not come be assured that God has heard you God has seen you he will work he will work why? because he loves you why? Because you're his child and he's not going to leave you as it is. And so we see um, as God talks with Moses, he says, this is what I'm going to do. And the first thing he tells Moses is this. He says, I'm going to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. I was thinking this morning as we were worshiping and as we were singing, and I was thinking about these first verses again. He says, I'm going to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians. We've talked about this before, but I want to remind you again. The power of the Egyptians at that time, that was the most powerful nation in their knowledge, in, in the world. They ruled everything. Nobody could defeat Egypt. Nobody could get away from Pharaoh. He ruled with an iron hand, not just the Israelites. Many people were his slaves. Nobody could get free until there was a greater power. And God was the greater power. And just the same, just the same for you and for me. When you were lost in sin, when I was lost in sin, when we were bound by habits and bound by these things, and, and some of us, sometimes even as Christians, we, we are bound in certain areas. And we feel like, I'll never be free. I'll never get out of this. Oh God, will I ever. I encourage you this morning that God has the power to set you free from your bondage and He will do it. He will do it. It will take a mighty power. You're not strong enough to set yourself free. Sometimes, you know, we live in a world where there's so many self-help books, aren't there? So many, do this, 10 steps to whatever. And those things aren't bad, but we, it's too easy to start thinking, now this is what I can do to completely change my life. When the truth is, brothers and sisters, that in most areas that matter, it is God who's going to have to make the difference in our lives. It's God who's going to set us free. And your loved ones that are in bondage, and you at times as well. It is God, it's the mighty power of God. If he could defeat Pharaoh, don't you think he can defeat the bondages and the enemies that, that, that are in your life as well? You think he can't do that? Of course he can. 
all the way back in the second book of the Bible, we have this encouragement that this is the type of God who is in our lives and who loves us and who cares for us. And so God says, I'm going to set them free, but setting free is not enough because setting free um, they would still be, where were they going to go? What were they going to do? And so God says, first of all, I'm going to set them free. Then he has a destination for them. He has something he's going to do for them, just as he does for us as well. Oh, the Israelites loved to hear that, didn't they? Don't we love to hear that? Yes, I'm going to be set free. Praise the Lord. And they certainly wanted that. But as we see, and as we talked about a couple of weeks ago, God was doing more than getting them out of Egypt and saving them from the power of Pharaoh. And we see that in Exodus 19, 4 through 6, and he's talking to, uh, to uh, Moses, and here's the message he's going to give them. Next slide. He says, you, you've seen what I did to the Egyptians. May I encourage you this morning? I, I want to just kind of make parallel applications as we go through this. Whenever you get discouraged at your own life, whenever you get discouraged at how things are at the present time, would you do what the children of Israel did. Look at what God says to them. He says, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians. Now think about your own life and apply it to yourself. Do you remember what God did for you? Do you remember how he set you free back when? Do you remember that? Do you remember the bondage you were in? Some of you I don't know because by the time I've come to know you, you've, you're already Christians. But some of you, I know the bondages you were in. Some of you, I know how God set you free. And it was miraculous. And he brought you to himself. And then, look at verse 5. He says, now if you will obey me and keep my covenant. So God has a, a, a requirement. God has a, a condition for what he wants to do. Look with me very carefully this morning. He says, if you will obey me and keep my covenant, you will be my own special treasure from among, among all the peoples of the earth, on the earth, for all the earth belongs to me, and you will be my kingdom of priests, my holy nation. God had more than a destination for them. God, we see now, he was gonna do more than just take them to this great land of milk and honey. God was saying, I want to do something special with you, in relationship with you. I want to make you my people. You're going to be my special people, a holy nation, a kingdom of priests. And that was a relationship with God and also a relationship with the world. Brothers and sisters, the same is true this morning. Listen, God is not just trying to get you to heaven. He's rescued you from hell. Praise the Lord. And we're thinking heaven is coming. Praise the Lord. Heaven is going to be great, right? Sure, it's going to be great. But listen, there's more than a destination that God has for you. God wants to develop a relationship with you and me. God wants to make you and God wants to make me his special treasure. You're my own. Don't you love that? You're a special treasure from among all, from among all the peoples on earth. You'll be my kingdom of priests, my holy nation. And that, was God's, that wasn't God's only purpose also. That was part of God's purpose. So God wants to do that. But let me ask you something, and this is what we've been talking about already. How is God going to do that? How's God going to do that? Okay? Is he just going to say, now you are my holy nation. Now you are my special treasure. Now you are my kingdom of priests. Is that how it works? It's not how it works because to be the special treasure of God and a holy nation and a kingdom of priests, they had to become that. It was a process. So God had gotten them out of Egypt, but Egypt was still in their hearts, right? He'd gotten them out of Egypt, but Egypt was all... Egypt was, was all that they knew. Egypt was where they had lived. All around them was the idolatrous worship of idols, of, of, of calves, of the sun, of the god, gods and goddesses of fertility with the Nile River and all of that. Oh, all sorts of things. And all of that was in their heart. All of that was in their lives. They couldn't be God's special treasure. They couldn't be God's holy nation. They couldn't be a kingdom of priests. There had to be a change. And God was going to have to work in them to bring that change. Now, brothers and sisters, you don't have to work to become a Christian. When God saves you, when you are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, you're saved. Okay? The Bible's very clear. It is not by works. We have been saved through grace alone. But when we are saved, 
then God works in our hearts and in our lives, doesn't he? Because he has purposes for us that go beyond whew, saving us out of hell and saving us from Egypt. We see this with the children of Israel, and that's what we see with us. God is still doing the same thing. His purposes haven't changed. Now, though these people are the, are the children, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, in their nature, in their character, in their attitude, in their faith, they're not really the people of God yet, are they? They're not the people of God. And let's see that. And let's see how Israel does. God gets them out of Egypt. Now, let's look at Exodus 14, 10, and 12. Here's the first, here's the first hurdle, if you will. They've got to get over this one. God brings them out, <coughs> and Pharaoh comes running after them with all of his hosts, with all of his chariots. The people of Israel looked up and they did what? Ah! They panicked. How many of you have ever panicked when the enemy is after you and when you are surrounded by the enemy, when you're surrounded by obstacles, when you're surrounded by difficulties? Have you panicked? Yeah, so have I, okay? And God is working. Now, does God judge you and say, you're such a bad Christian? You are such a bad Christian. Why are you panicking? No, but listen, brothers and sisters, God is working in your life, and he's working in my life in those situations to make us into the people of God, okay? And the people of God will trust him, and the people of God will obey him, but they don't, do they? I was looking at this yesterday, and you know what I saw? These children of Israel sure do worry about death a lot. A lot, as we're going to see. They say, why did you make us leave Egypt? Weren't there enough graves for us in Egypt? We're going to die in the wilderness. What have you done to us? Didn't we tell you this would happen? By the way, look at verse 12 with me. We said, leave us alone. Let us be slaves. Now, the Bible does not record that they ever said that. Have you noticed that? If you go back and read it, there's no record of the children of Israel in Egypt saying, no, let us stay in Egypt as slaves. It's better to, to, to live as slaves than die in the wilderness. And God, if they're going to be his people, God's going to have to change that attitude. So they sort of fail. They stumble over the first hurdle, don't they? They're not really the people of God yet, okay? Let's look at what happens next. He, he, oh, they overcome. He's gotten them out of Egypt. You think he can't defeat Pharaoh? Sure he can. Okay, next slide. Okay, what happens next? He leads them out. This is about three days. They've just, by the way, was that a great victory over Pharaoh? The waters rose up. They went through. Don't you think their faith should be great? Sure. They go three days in the wilderness. What happens next? They have a water issue. And they travel to Merah. They can't find any water. When they came to the oasis of Merah, the water was too bitter to drink. By the way, they named it Merah. Merah means bitterness. So the water, there was water there, but it was too bitter, bitter to drink. And then they complained and they turned against Moses. But by the way, whenever they turn against Moses, what they're, who they're really turning against is God, right? So they're turning against God. And they complained, what are we going to drink? They demanded, wow from slaves to demanding, right? And so we see they, 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 haven't, they haven't yet become the, the children of God, have they? The people of God. They're, how would you like this as your special treasure? <laughs> Not very special at this point, is it? Let's go a little bit further, okay? The next, the, the next one, the, they keep on going. They set out and then they journey into the wilderness between Elam and Mount Sinai. They arrive there. Remember what I told you? They have a thing about death. Verse 3, if only the Lord had killed us back in Egypt. They're, all the, they're just thinking about death all the time. There we sat around pots filled with meat, ate, ate all the bread we want, but now you've brought us into this wilderness to starve us all to death. All they're thinking about is death. I was thinking about something yesterday as I was preparing and, and, and looking over these verses. Um, look at what the children of Israel keep saying. Look at what they say about Moses and God. You've brought us here to make us starve. You've brought us here to let us die of thirst. You've brought us here to let us be killed by our enemies. That is the only perspective they have. That's the only thing they can see. Remember what God said at the beginning of all of this? Remember? 
God said, I'm going to get you out of Egypt and I'm going to take you into a wonderful land. I'm going to take you into a land flowing with milk and honey. How quickly they forget what God has said. All they can see are their present difficulties. All they can see are, we're going to die. And I want to encourage you, brothers and sisters, you and I are just like that. We are just like that, aren't we? Just go ahead and nod your head and say, yes, that's how I am. We're exactly the same way. God has said to us, this is what I'm going to do. And you and I go along for a little while and we get into difficulties and we get into hardships and all we can see is the hardness. And all we can say is, oh God, why have you done this? Oh God, why have you let this happen? And we forget that God has said, I'm going to do something wonderful in your life. And so they fail. We go a little bit further. Um, and what do we see next? Next slide, okay. Uh, okay, water again, again. They go out, they come to Rephidim, there's no water. So they complain against Moses, give us water to drink. Moses <coughs> is tired of messing around with them. And what does Moses say? Quiet! Do you know what he should, what he really meant when he said quiet? Shut up. That's what he meant. He did, they just didn't say shut up at that time. But that's what he meant. He says, why are you complaining against me? Why are you testing the Lord? But they, uh, they still have a thing with death, don't they? Are you trying to kill us, our children and our livestock? All they can think about is death. So they fail again. They're really not yet the people of God. And then there's one more, okay? There's one more. Their hearts and their heads are still full of Egypt. Let's look at the last one. The last one is the worst one of all. They are now three months out of Egypt. Three months. God has been showing miracles. And Moses is up on the mountain. He's up there for 40 days. And the people say, we don't know where Moses is. And while Moses is up on the mountain, what are the people down there doing? What are the people doing? He says, they've corrupted themselves. How quickly they have turned away from the way I commanded them to live. They have melted down gold and made a calf, and they've bowed down to it and sacrificed. They are saying, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. What idolatry, what idolatry. The people, when, they, when Aaron makes the calf, remember we talked about this two weeks ago, the calf, the calf was one of the symbols of the many gods of Egypt. And he was worshipped in more than, he was a symbol for more than one god. And that's what their hearts have gone back to. Though God has gotten them out of Egypt, Egypt is still in their hearts. And Egypt is still in their thoughts. Brothers and sisters, listen. This morning, God has gotten us out of the world. He has saved us. He has brought us out of darkness and into light. But how much of the world and the ways of the world and the thinking of the world are still in us? You see, God has brought us out of that. But then God has to work in us to transform us. A little bit later this morning, we're going to look at some of the New Testament passages. So when God begins working in your heart, when God begins working in your life, He's doing more than getting you out and delivering you from sin. He's changing you. His purpose is to change you. His purpose is to change me and to make me His special treasure. To make me a child of His that reflects His glory and that looks like Him. That's why we talk about these things. That's why we look at these things. It's not just we look at the Bible, and, and I really, I'm just speaking to you really from my heart this morning. We look at the Bible and sometimes we look at the New Testament we think, oh, so many rules, so many whatever. Oh, don't do this and don't do that. That's not what God is about, brothers and sisters. God's not a God of rules. It, and so many people think about it that way, don't they? God's a God of rules. That's not what God is about. God is a God of love. And what God is trying to do in you and what God is trying to do in me, He's trying to make me His own. He's trying to make me His special treasure because all the blessings of God that He's promised them and all the blessings of God that He's promised you and me, it will not be mine and it will not be yours until we are truly His special treasure, until we're living in right and good relationship with Him. And that's what God is trying to do. That's what God is trying to do. Now, let me go back to Mara 
just a minute. And let's look at the next slide, Exodus 15 and 25. I want to show you something. They go back to Merah. This is where they failed the water test. Does any, okay, here's a, a young, oh, I, I was going to, okay, we've got two Joshuas in here this morning. Anne Marie is, uh, Anne Marie's not here. Yes, she is. Where's Anne Marie? Anne Marie, there you are. Okay, young people. Uh, all the grown-ups, I want you, you, you just sit, you, you sit and listen just a minute. I'm going to ask the young people just a minute, okay? At Mara, the water was bitter. Did God answer them? Did God, did God do something at Mara? Yes or no? They're putting their heads down. Okay, parents, work with your kids more. Joseph, Joshua, do you know what happened at Mara? Not sure, right? Okay, keep lit. Do you know? Quick, Mom, tell him. That's right. He's doing the right hand motions. Anybody else? Josh over there? Uh huh. Okay. Anne Marie? All right. Mom and dads, work on them, okay? What happens if. Okay, so a grown up now. What happened? So, okay, so before I see, I gave a hard time to the youngsters. Let me now, let me, let me, adults. What happened at Mara? What's the end, what's the end of this story? Come on. What? Ha, you're right, French. It became sweet. How did it become sweet? He threw something. What did he throw? Come on. He threw a stick. Okay. God showed him a stick. And Moses threw the stick in the water, and the water became sweet. Don't you wish you could find a stick like that? I do, too. I think it was a God stick, don't you? God showed him a stick. Now, do you think there was sweetness in that stick? Of course not. It was God. It, that's right. It was the power of God, okay? So, look what happens next. God meets their need even though they complain, and he's still trying to make them his people. They have failed the test because they're complaining. He supplies their need, and then he works in them to test them and train them. How many of you, when God has done something in your life and you, you failed and you've been really disappointed in yourself, how many of you failed before and you, knew, and you realized, I blew it, I failed the test? Yes or no? Yes. We all wave our hands, right? And if you don't wave your hand, then you, then you, you failed the truth test. <laughs> you just failed the truth test. Okay? It's true. You failed the truth test. Okay. Look at something here that will encourage you this morning. Pr I promise you, this will encourage you. They have failed the test. They've, they've complained. God meets their need. And then God teaches them something in that moment of failure. May I encourage you this morning? If you have failed in your life at times as you've walked with the Lord, trust Him, give that failure to Him, and let Him teach you something from the failure. Learn something from the failure. Because God wants to do that. Do you know that if your life is in God's hands, nothing is wasted? Nothing's wasted. Even your failures. Now, does God want you to fail? No! He wants you to win. He wants you to overcome. But God will take your failures and He will teach you. And so He teaches them. What does He teach them? He says to them, if you will listen carefully, to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in His sight, obeying His commands, then I won't make you suffer any of the diseases I sent on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. And so He uses a teaching moment. Now why does He say, I'm the Lord who heals you? Why would He say that at that moment? Why do you think He said that? He could have said anything. I think it is because the Lord healed the waters. That's what I think. The waters were bitter. They could not produce life. They could not be drunk. They could not give life. And God healed the water. And there's a picture in the physical realm of what God does for us in our bodies and in our spirits as well. Isn't that encouraging? He says, I'm the God who heals you. Now I want you to see one other thing as you look at that. The Lord set before them the following decree as a standard to test their faithfulness. And so God takes their failure and teaches them something and says, now this is what I want from you. God is working so that they will trust Him and so that they will obey Him. And that's what God is doing in your life and my life as well. Now I want to show you one other thing. Look at what comes next. The verse that comes after that, after leaving Merah, 
the Israelites traveled on to the oasis of Elam. Is there bitter water in Elam? No. There's good water in Elam. They found 12 springs, not just one spring. They found 12 springs and 70 palm trees. Wow! So there are 12 springs, there's an abundance of water, and it's good water, and there's shade as well. So that's all part of the experience. Now, let me ask you something this morning. Look at this carefully, and let's apply it to our own lives. Who led the children of Israel, think about yourself right now, who led the children of Israel to Merah, where the waters were bitter? Who did? God did. To a place where there was bitter water. Who led the children of Israel? Thank you for turning off your phones. Who led the children of Israel to Elam, where there was an abundance of water, it was sweet and there was shade. Who did it? God. Was it God both times? Yes. Did God love them in both places? Yes. Did, did, did God work in both places? Yes. Was God working and teaching them something in both places? Yes. It was God. You and I, when we go through, when we come to places that we would say, it's Mara, it's Mara, it's bitter, it's bitter. I don't want to be here. Nevertheless, our God has led us there. And He can heal the water at Mara and give you sweet water. Do you have places of bitterness in your life this morning? Do you Have you come to a place where it is hard, God? There's no refreshing here. It feels like Mara to me. Oh God, oh God. God, oh God, look to the God that heals the water and look to the God who heals you. He makes what is bitter sweet. He does that. Oh, brothers and sisters, that is the story of God working with his people in the, in the Bible. Remember in the book of Ruth when, when um, Naomi says, she comes back and she says, do you remember what she tells the people to call her? She changes her name. What is it? Mara. What does Mara mean? Bitter. Because Naomi said, I, my life is bitter, my husband, all of this. And all she could see was the bitterness. What did God do? God made it sweet. And Ruth gave Ruth a husband and a child. And Naomi's, Naomi's bitterness was turned to joy. Brothers and sisters, if God would do that for these old dusty people of the past, that from, don't you think He wants to do the same thing in your life and in my life? He will take what is bitter and He will make it sweet. This is what God will do. And may I encourage you as you go through it to look in the same way. It's not a, a hard thing, but God is also, there is a test for you. There is a test for me. There's a test of faithfulness. And it's not God giving you a test. Well, you're going to fail. It's going to be too hard. No, brothers and sisters. The Lord your God and the Lord my God, He brings us to places called Mara. And He brings us to testings that we might be, what? Made like Him. That we might become truly His people. Because when we're truly His people, we're going to be in the place of Mara. And we're not going to say, Oh God, why did you bring me here? Oh God, why did you let this happen? When we're really His children and we're, and we're trusting Him and when we're obeying Him and when we're looking to Him, we're going to come into places of bitterness and we're going to cry out to the Lord. But our cry is going to be, Oh God, heal the waters and bring sweetness and bring life into my life again. That's what God does. And that's what the people of God do. And when we are His special treasure and when, we is, when He has made us His own, that will be our testimony at Merah. And that will be our testimony at Elam. Because He's making us into His people. So brothers and sisters, as we walk this year, and as we go through this year, and as we go through all these things, know, know that God wants to get you through this year. God wants you to make it in an overcoming way. He does. God wants to bless you. God wants to get you through difficulties, just as you want Him to get you through difficulties. But never forget, God wants to do more than that. He wants to do more than that. He wants to make you His special possession, His special treasure. And the only way He can do that is through some of these places called Mara.
through some of these places where there's no meat, where there's no water, and what happens in those places where there's no meat and where there's no water. I'm going to skip a whole bunch. I'm going to skip a whole bunch. Go to go to slide go to slide 11. I'm going to skip a whole bunch. I want us to I want us to get to this this morning. Go to slide 11. Remember I told you 2 weeks ago that we would get to Deuteronomy 8. I gave you some homework. I don't know if you did it or not. Deuteronomy 8 is the key is the key to Exodus, Leviticus, all Numbers, Deuteronomy, all of it, Deuteronomy 8. It's the key to 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. Moses brings it all together. They're just getting ready to go into the promised land. And Moses reminds them. And so we look at this just as we come to a close here this morning. Look at what Moses says to his people. And I won't, we're not going to read it all, but I'm putting these up here so you can see some of it. These are the words of the Lord. He says, be careful to obey all the commands I'm giving you today. You see, God was taking his people into the promised land, and there they stood. Wilderness behind them, the promised land before them. Yeah? Wilderness behind, promised land before. And God had worked those 40 years to make these people not slaves of Egypt, but people of God, his special treasure. Because God was going to take them into the promised land. And in that promised land, if they were still thinking, Egypt, 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 the promised land would soon become just like Egypt to them. And so what did God have to do all those 40 years? Oh, He worked in them. Just as He works in you, brothers and sisters. Just as He works in me. He takes us through these things. And He's testing our heart. He's testing our character. And I want to say something. I don't care how young you are this morning. Oh, Nat Nat, you were sitting over there and I forgot you. I was looking at these three over here. Maybe Nat Nat would have known the answer. Throw that stick into that water. But I don't care how, how young you are this morning. Those of you who are young people, listen. The testing of God and the proving of your character, it doesn't wait until you're grown up. It begins when you become His child. It begins then. And do you know how long it continues? It continues until you get to heaven. It continues until you get to heaven. Every one of us. You say, oh yeah, but you and Pastor Renee, you've passed all the tests and, and you're preaching to us because you have all the answers. Uh-uh. I'm not in heaven yet. He's not in heaven yet. We still have testings. God's still working on us. God's still working on you. Why? Because He's making us into His special treasure. Look what He says. Remember how the Lord your God led you through the wilderness for these 40 years, humbling you, testing you. Why? Because He's a hard God. Because He's mean and because He's got so many rules. That's what we think, isn't it? Is that what it says? No. To prove your character. To find out whether or not you would obey His commands. So what does He do? Look at the next part, verse 3. Yes, He humbled you by letting you go hungry and then feeding you with manna, a food previously unknown to you and your ancestors. How many of you love the word humble? You love it. It's your, one, it's your favorite vocabulary word. How many of us hate the word humble? I hate humbling. I hate it. I hate it. Because humbling involves a breaking. Humbling involves a dependence. Do you know why God tests us and proves us and works on these things? He does it to humble us. You say, why would God do that? Because if you and I are not humble in heart and humble in character, if you and I are proud of ourselves, if you and I think I can do it, I don't need other people. I can make it by myself. I'm smart enough to make this happen. If we are not humbled, we'll never learn. We'll never learn. We'll never learn. And so God has to, has to give you and me the opportunity to be humbled. What does He do? Does He beat them? Does God beat them to humble them? No! How does he humble them? 
That's right. They get hungry and then he feeds them manna. That's the humbling. What does that mean? It means they're in the wilderness and they can't provide for themselves. So what do they have to do? Humble, by the way, humble means to go low or to be put down. That's what it means, to, to, to be low. They couldn't feed themselves. What happens when we're humbled? Oh, God. And then what do we do? Here we go. Oh, God. And then what do we have to do? There you go. We have to lean on God, don't we? We have to lean on God. How many of you took time during the week of fasting and prayer to fast and to pray? You, you just, you, most of us did. What happened during that time? We were humbled. <laughs> were you hungry? I was hungry. I thought about food all week long. <laughs> we were talking about that. We're, we were humbled. In ourselves, we were, there was a humbling. And what did we do during that time? We leaned on God. We leaned on God. Now that's just one example. But brothers and sisters, you and I also come to circumstances where Mara, the water is bitter, where we cannot provide for ourselves. Or parents, you may have a child or a grandchild, or husbands and wives, you may have a spouse, and they're breaking your heart. They're breaking your heart. And you have done everything you can do, or a situation, or an employer, or a boss, or, or whoever, and you've tried to show love, and the love is spurned. You've tried to be obedient, and, 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 you're, and, and there's harsh return. And it's humbling, isn't it? And you come to the end of yourself, and there's nothing more you can do. I want to encourage you this morning to look at it as an opportunity where there's a humbling of yourself and a leaning on God. A leaning on God. And when there is a leaning on God, listen, when there's a leaning on God, then God is making you into Himself. God is making you into his special treasure. Go to the very last slide. The very, very last one. We're, I'm skipping a whole lot. Go to the very last one. Um, I want to look at 1 Peter 2, 8 and 9. Look at these two verses. I've been staying in the Old Testament this morning, but I want you to put these two verses together. Do you remember what God said? If you'll obey me, you'll be my own special treasure from among all the peoples on the earth. Look at what Peter says in the New Testament. He says those other people, they stumble. They don't obey God's word. What's God trying to do? He's working obedience. And then look at what Peter says about you and me this morning. Look carefully and we come to a close. But you are not like that. Listen. For you are a chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. Do you think when Peter wrote that, he was aware of the words of God all the way back? Look at that. It's a beautiful parallel, isn't it? There's the Old Testament God saying that, and here's the New Testament. And brothers and sisters, this year, this year, you're going to face hard times, but God has manna for you. Where does the manna come from? It comes from God. You don't have manna in your pocket. You don't have manna in your bank account. You don't have manna in a bag that you can get it. It only comes from God. It only comes from God. But as it comes from God and you receive from God, He will make you His special treasure, His holy possession. As you walk with Him, as you obey Him, as you come to a mirror, and instead of saying, Why, God? Instead you say, Oh, God, make the water sweet. Make the water sweet. And may I say something to you this morning? Sometimes I think Mara is not the water so much as it is us. Right? We get bitter, don't we? We get nasty. We get unpleasant to be around. But God can heal us and make us sweet. He can make us His special treasure. Let's close in prayer. 
Lord, we thank you. God, we 